For today's review, we'll be looking at the Logos Complete Study Bible in the American Standard Version. It's the Bible on top, and for the purposes of comparing the size, I have the Thompson Chain Reference Bible in the King James Version, and the Reformation Study Bible in the New King James Version. And actually, they're all quite similar in size, um, footprint-wise, wise, uh, height, and width. The uh, Logos International Study Bible and Thompson Chain Reference are very similar. The Logos is a thicker Bible compared with the Reformation Study Bible in the New King James Version. The same is true again, height-wise, they're very similar, and width is quite similar. But the uh, Reformation Study Bible is a thicker book. I also have a hardback copy that we'll look at from time to time, but I'll focus for my review on this imitation leather book that we have here that is nine and a half inches tall, six and thirteen sixteenths inches wide, and two and three sixteenths inches thick. It's interesting here on the spine, they tell you a bit about it. The title, the fact that it's in the American Standard Version, very decorative cross, and then some of the material that you'll find on the inside. It is, in fact, uh, in two columns of text. Each column is 46 and a half millimeters wide. The total distance between line and line here is 97 millimeters. I count about 34 characters per line, and you can get 51 lines per page, as you do here where there are no notes at the bottom of this page. So 51 lines is the maximum. Page dimensions are 234 millimeters, uh, 234 millimeters tall, 161 millimeters wide, that's 9.2 inches tall, 6.3 inches wide. Margins are variable at the top from the line to the edge, varies between 17 and 21 millimeters at the bottom is 13 to 17 millimeters. The inner margin from this line to the gutter is about 25 millimeters or approximately an inch. And the outer from the line to the edge varies between 32 and 34 millimeters. The font in the text is about 10 points compared to the Times New Roman font. And uh, the line height is almost 11 points. I calculate it to be 10.9 and so that's why that is so easy on the eyes. It's because the distance between the lines is very generous. Uh, verse numbers are a bit hard to find. They're inside the paragraph so your eye can catch them but it's not quite as easy as it would be in a verse-by-verse -verse Bible. Uh, paragraph by paragraph is typically the way the American Standard Version, which is known for using Jehovah as the name for God in the Old Testament, the way the American Standard Version is typically formatted. It is not line matched, but I don't think that's a problem here because the paper is reasonably opaque. It's older paper from 1972. Added words, uh, words that the, uh, the translators add for um, to make to make things make sense in English are in an italic font and you can tell it's italic by looking at that A there. Ink is reasonably black but the uh, we'll talk about print non-uniformity non in a minute and you'll see there is some of those so where it's printed darkly the ink is definitely black. Uh, there are references throughout. References come in two columns the uh, references that go with the left column are in the gutter. The, if the references that go with the column closest to the gutter are in the gutter, and the outside columns references are outside near the edge of the page. The font in the references is about seven points. There are also, in addition to references, which we'll take a look at later, there are translation notes. So the American Standard Version translation notes are here. And they are sorted in with the uh, with the references. So here's another translation note saying that the Hebrew text can be read two different ways. 
in that particular verse. Paper is uh, 33.5 microns thick. I estimate the paper weight to be about 30 GSM. It has a non-shiny, non-waxy surface, so you get some diffuse glare off it, but you don't get a sheen. It is white paper, but I think it's yellowed a bit with age. And I, as we pointed out, there is minimal show through. Here you are in the poetry sections, and you can see words printed on the opposite page, but it's pretty dim. There is some print on uniformity. We'll see if we can get quickly to a place where I can demonstrate that. I'm going to look at pages 2265 and 2273. Hold it up to the camera so that you can see them side by side. 2265 on the left is reasonably dark. 2273, just a few pages later, is much lighter. And that's typical, that's, that happens throughout this particular Bible. There are book introductions, and we're looking here at Philemon. And the introduction to Philemon is in the notes at the bottom of the page. Um, book titles are top center of the page. It would be better if they were in the outside. Page contents are given in the outside, so this page spans Titus 3.1 through Titus 3.15. Page numbers are given at the bottom center of the page. There are no headings in the text. All the headings are at the top of the page, like so. Here you see the headings in Hebrews. So essentially that's all you have. Headings in all caps and about a seven point font all at the top of the page. Chapter numbers are very easy to find. Find they're very large and bold. Uh, all the books of the Bible begin on a separate page. I can look and show that that's true in a little book like Ruth, uh, Jude. Since I'm here in Jude, Jude begins on its own page, as does 3 John. Let's flip back and show that. 3 John begins on its own page as well. Words of Christ in this Bible very happily are in black. You can flip through the Gospels and see all the ink here is the same color as everywhere else in the book. Quotations. Uh, in the New Testament from the Old Testament are typically printed in this indented style. You will not find all caps like say in a New American Standard Bible, but they're reasonably easy to locate. They'll be indented like that. All right. Um, just for the fun of it, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 1. And here's a quotation from the Old Testament in verse uh, 19. And then there's another quotation here in verse 31. And it is not indented, but you have notes here. Uh, point you to verse 30, 31 down below and number 8 there tells you that it's a quotation that's what the Q is for from Jeremiah 9.23 so that's the way this book deals with Old Testament quotations there are three kinds of notes at the bottom of each page when they don't appear in, on each page all three but you have topical notes like here. So here's a topical note on calling, which covers both the columns at the bottom of the page and extends into the following page. You typically have um, uh, variorum renderings and variorum readings on most pages. 
So here, in this page in 1 Corinthians, you have very arm renderings. This is how other authorities have translated the text. And very arm readings. This is different uh, readings in the source material. So here, where in the New Testament, this would be different Greek manuscripts or different Greek uh, printed translations, not translations, editions, printed editions of the Greek, and how they read. All of those are in a seven-point font. At the end of the Bible, there's an index. And the index is useful in finding the material in the footnotes at the bottom of the page and places in the references where uh, those uh, different topics that you see are um, referenced. The uh, index is 45 pages long. It has three columns per page, and it is in about an eight-point font. And we'll talk a bit later about how to use the index. After the index, there's something called the Layman's Commentary on the Holy Spirit. It is 120 pages long, two columns per page, and in, a, in about a 10.5 point font. The stop ends with a timeline of the acts of the of the Holy Spirit in the early church, and then the cross references to scriptures that they've cited in that uh, essay followed by a concordance. The concordance is 68 pages long. It has its own list of abbreviations used in the concordance. It is in a seven-point font. It has entries in bold type. And then it has the context lines on separate lines, which make them easy to find. I had heard that this concordance is keyed not to the American Standard Version, but to the King James Version. It only took me two entries to prove that that's true, because that context line is not the American Standard Version. But it's not too bad, I think, because the American Standard Version is not radically different from the King James Version. At the end of the concordance, you come to two sheets, four blank pages for notes, and then there are 12 Nelson maps that span eight pages. They are on a lightweight paper, not quite as heavy as a normal cardstock. Fairly detailed, quite colorful. These are old style Nelson maps. They span eight pages. Here you can see the stitching in the gutter. And none of the maps goes into the gutter. And then you are at the end of the Bible, a single page of cardstock, and a paste down construction. This Bible has one black ribbon. It is uh, six millimeters wide and 335 millimeters long. There are red and yellow head and tail bands. It has a sewn binding as we've seen. It lies very flat quite early on in the book. It had uh, gilt edges, but the gilding seems to have largely worn off in this old book. Black imitation leather, leather cover, as we've said. It has a librarian tape to reinforce the hinges on my copy. Paste down construction. In front, uh, someone has trimmed the first in sheet in my copy. I imagine that someone wrote some personal information in there at one time and wanted to hide it. Here's the title page. And the copyright page from 1972 by Thomas Nelson for the American Standard Version. version. And then this Logos International Edition is copyright 1972 as well. in the United States. Here's the preface, and I think if you look at the preface you'll see that this looks kind of odd. This is a lighter font, and then it goes dark. And I'll explain why that is in just a moment. So 
So after the end of the preface, there's a list of abbreviations for the Old Testament, names of translators, etc. So these are ancient translators of the Old Testament. And then there's a New Testament section, names of modern commentators. These are names that you will find in the Variorum renderings and the Variorum readings. Names of ancient commentators, occasionally quoted. Then the names of old versions. Then they talk about manuscripts. And here's something else that's interesting. When you read about Codex Alexandrinus, you say, you read, which may probably have been made. And if you turn the page, hoping to see the rest of that sentence, you see an en entry on C, Codex C. And so something clearly has been left out, and you already had that su suggestion that something odd was going on when you looked at the preface. Well, what's gone on is they've done a pretty bad job of editing the introductory material from the uh, 1910 cross-reference Bible. If you do a uh, Google search or some other internet engine and you search on Monser, who was the name of the editor, and the cross-reference Bible, you can go to archive.org and you can find the original preface. And so, this is our preface here, and it starts with a single paragraph, and it jumps to how to use this Bible. Well, how to use this Bible is on page two of the original preface. So they've left out this material that explains to you how to use the topical anal analysis, a paragraph of caution, before going to how to use this Bible. So you can print all this material out. And... We noticed that here we were missing an uh, end of a sentence about Codex Alexandrinus corrections, which may probably have been made by the original scribe himself, are denoted by a asterisk, etc. And then we go on all this about the different codices here. So the next page after that, Codex C, follows all that material that had been left out from the cross-reference Bible. So your, your takeaway from that is that the Logos International Study Bible is essentially a more modern edition of the 1910 cross-reference Bible. Now we're looking at the second title page. And on the back side of that, you see the contributors, the editor is Harold Monser, who was the editor for the Cross-Reference Bible that came out in 1910. And uh, the list of contributors, all of whom were long dead by the time of 1972, when the Logos International Study Bible came out. You should be seeing here a uh, page where we talk about the contributors and I was just curious so I did some internet searching to see if I could find out any background on them. It looks like four of these gentlemen were associated with the restoration movement, the disciples of Christ or the Christian churches. Um, two of them, no, three of them were Baptists, two were uh, uh, Methodists, and then you have one Congregationalist and one Presbyterian and a few of them were um, noted scholars. A.T. Robin, Robertson uh, is a well-known name. But a few of them were well-known in the day, like uh, A.C. Zenos. So in this section, I just want to give you a feel for these page-bottom topical notes. Um, we're in Genesis, Genesis 1. There's an asterisk beside beginning, and there's a little dagger beside God. If we look at the bottom of the page, We'll see here on the left the word beginnings with the asterisk beside it, and then a list of all kinds of verse references with topical headings in front of them. So, beginnings of creation, beginnings of sin, beginnings of death, etc., etc. Each of them lists a string of verses where that subject is discussed later in the Bible. Beginnings of restoration. Then we come over to the next 
God, God is almighty, creator, all references to God creating, creator of man, God is from everlasting to everlasting. So for each of these subjects it gives these little statements which we can then learn something from. God knows all. Then uh, a section on his foreknowledge, his immutability, his omnipresence, etc. And on God it goes on throughout the second page and the third page of the notes. There's a section on anthropomorphisms. His back, his shoulders, his feet. The next page continues. God's our savior here in this section. Then the fatherhood of God in the New Testament, God the Father of Jesus. The section on God continues on this page and runs down to here. Then above on the end of the first chapter of Genesis, beginning of the second chapter of Genesis, there's an asterisk beside Earth and there's a note series of references having to do with earth. It starts with earth as the creation of God, as man's residence, separated from the waters, functions of the earth, and it goes on, not quite nearly as long as the article on God, and stops here where we have an asterisk that is tied to the word seventh here for the number seven. And references to the number of set number seven in the Bible, which go on to the second column of page six, where we have a note on man, which is asterisked above in chapter two, verse seven, man. And so man starts on the bottom of page six and continues all through page seven. Let's see if I can show that a bit better like that. And at some point we have a, on page seven we have another note starting on life temporal or physical, nefesh and psyche, the life that we now live in Christ, and it goes on to eternal life, and then you have a note on animals, and so it continues like that throughout the book. So in this little section I would like to show how to use the Variorum renderings. And we're looking at the renderings on 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. So just to give you the context, here's that section. And um, Paul is writing saying, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye, each of you know how to possess himself of his own vessel, and not in passion of lust like the Gentiles that no man transgress and wrong his brother. So there in verse 6, the question is, how do we translate the word transgress? Uh, and that's what the note here is about. The very Orem rendering in verse 6, First Thessalonians 4, 6, where the American Standard Version has transgress. And then it says, so D-E-W and L-U. If you go back to the list of abbreviations, you find that D-E-W is a guy named DeWet, and L-U is Luneman. So these people must have been well known around 1910, 
and commonly available in the libraries of ministers who would be using this, then after those two sources, people who agree with transgress, you have people who go with go beyond is the right reading. And so if we look back in the same appendix again, we find that um, AL is uh, the Reverend D.H. Alford and uh, D.A. is uh, the Reverend Samuel Davison and etc. So these sources here are actually not much use to us uh, moderns who do not have ready access to those sources. Um, they may be available in Google Books or on archive.org. I haven't checked, but I think just reading the varying renderings is more interesting than trying to find who these people were that uh, supported the different renderings. Now I've taken us to John um, 118 in order to take a look at the variorum readings. So this is where the text, the source text, varies. And just to remind you how John 118 reads, in the American Standard Version it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The issue is how this particular portion is to be read. Let's look at 18. The only begotten Son. So it's, there's a variant here having to do with the only begotten Son. But the only begotten Son is the way that A and the third corrector to C. So these are manuscripts. And um, this is one of those points where it would be useful to print out all the preface from the cross-reference Bible unless you already know what these are. But, uh, they really should have included that page that they omitted from early in the uh, cross-reference Bible gives you that information. And then OL is Old Latin, VULG is the Vulgate. The Old Latin was originally the Vulgate, but then after Jerome, Jerome's Vulgate became the Vulgate, and uh, CUR is uh, um, the uh, Curatonian Kyr uh, Syriac. Uh, EUS is Eusebius, ATH is probably Athanasius, Theod is Theodosius, uh, Theodore of Mops Mopsuatia, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's who that is. Theodore, Bishop of Mopsuatia. So that's how one reads this. Uh, then, So that's the version that's in the text. That's the reading that's in the text. Then later on, after these uh, more modern authorities, who again, you have to look back to the abbreviations to find out who they are. Then there's another reading, God Only Begotten, which is an Aleph, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and the original reading in B and in L, and they give us some ancient, uh, ancient sources for that reading as well. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, uh, Basil the Great, and that's Trigellus, I think. W.H. is Westcott and Hort. Now still on the topic of um, Variorum uh, readings, I just wanted to point out that you can't expect too much of this Bible. There's only so much room, and they do not include all the variant readings. Um, looking here at Hebrews 11.23, and there's a well-known um, variant that appears in Codex D at the end of the verse. D adds, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, destroyed the Egyptian when he observed the humiliation of his brothers. But on this particular page, no zero variorum readings are mentioned at all. Now, in, in this Bible, the topical notes are put at the bottom of the page, but they're in no clear order. They're in, like, say, in the Thompson Chain reference, where they're all in the back and ordered in this numerical way. Here they are at the bottom of the page and they are fit there wherever the editors thought it made most sense. So I'll give you an example of how one might use this. Um, 
Here in John 1, 9, there is an F beside the word world, every man coming into the world. So what does it say about world? Go over here to the margin where you find F. There's the word world, and it points you to Revelation 10.6. So if we go to Revelation 10.6, we'll use our hardback copy, which I already have open there. Revelation 10.6 we find an asterisk, asterisk beside the word earth here and if you look at the bottom of the page here is a little article on the word world and so it has all this different information it belongs to God Psalm 50 12 Christ prayed not for John 17 9 so all those uh, different instances where world is mentioned Christians not fashioned like the world uh, end of the world and then this note continues so in most pages in the Bible you have these topical notes and they have to do with a specific subject here we are talking about the world and um, you find them by either starting with the notes in the side columns or by starting with the index in the back in this portion of the video I'd like to show how to use the index so I've taken you back to the index in the back we're looking at page 2375 and uh, just as an example, let's see what we can find out in the topical notes at the bottom of the pages that have to do with um, the day of the Lord. So just try to find something about the day of the Lord. I've gone into the index, and here's the entry for day. There's an entry for day of atonement, an entry for day's journey, 40 days, day spring, and then at the top of the next column, there's one for day star. So it looks like we're striking out um, nothing here on Day of the Lord, but here's a generic day, so perhaps there's something useful to us on page 228. So I will zoom out so I can fit in my hardback copy, the Logos International Bible, which I have open to page 228, and at the top of page 228 there's an asterisk next to days, and I go down to the bottom of the page, and there's an entry on day, creative time periods. Go into the next column where this article continues. Judicial periods. Well, that's good. It's day of anger, day of wrath, and then there's one on day of vengeance. And finally, day of Jehovah, which is what we would expect to see in the American Standard Version where the Lord in the Old Testament is rendered by the 19th century German guess uh, Jehovah. There's also a day of judgment here. So in a nutshell that's how you would use the index to try to... I think this is a very nicely laid out Bible. I think it's very easy to read. I like the narrow columns. I really like this line spacing. So that's very easy on the eyes and the font is reasonably large so in my view this is probably the best American Standard Version um, from a reader's perspective that I've ever found I'm going to do some font comparisons now if I possibly can and I'm going to bring over a uh, Nelson American Standard Version and try to put it side by side at a similar spot Compare the fonts, and it's about as good as I can do. So it's printed more darkly on the right, but look how much closer those lines are spaced in the, in the Nelson on the right. It really is a more pleasant reading experience, at least in my opinion, in the uh, Logos International Study Bible on the left. Here is another Nelson. This is a uh, about a nine-point font in a teacher's edition. We'll try to do the same thing here with this. Bring the text in. Paper here is considerably more yellow on the right. 
font is smaller, uh, printed more darkly, but um, columns are wider on the right, and the line spacing is closer. So actually, again, the book on the left, to my view, is easier to read. It's a better setting. Well, it's time now for a summary, and I'd like to say that of, of the key features of this Bible, of uh, the, uh, the references, the uh, topical notes at the bottom of the page, the variorum renderings, the variorum readings, and the text. Although I think all the, uh, all the rest is quite good, what I like most about it is the text. It's, a, it's an American Standard Version Bible that's actually printed relatively well. I wish it were more uniform, but I very much like the typeface. I think this is eminently readable, and it's much better than any other American Standard Version edition that I've seen. Now, you'll see uh, negative comments about the American Standard Version online about how it never achieved much of a reputation for being a very readable translation and its stiffness and its woodenness. But I gotta tell you, I, I actually quite like it. Um, it's not as poetic as the King James Version, that's true. And it did make the mistake of choosing to use Jehovah for the name of God in the Old Testament. But I really appreciate its literalness. It's literal and still readable at the same time. They may have gone too far in terms of trying to have consistency um, between the source language word and the translated word. But um, again, it doesn't bother me with the way they've done it. So I, I very much like the American Standard Version. And I think this is the best setting for the American Standard Version that's available. I wish there were others. I wish uh, someone would bring it out with modern printing techniques, but uh, no one has. So um, the other features are nice, but uh, to me the main thing is the American Standard Version text in a highly readable setting, and I very much like it. American Standard Version of the uh, 17 or so translations I've scored to date. Uh, by the way, I'm working on the Revised English Bible and should have that done in a few weeks. Of those translations I've scored to date, the American Standard Version is the most literal. Well, thank you for watching the video, this uh, overview of the Logos Complete Study Bible or International Study Bible. I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, please remember to hit the like button, and I encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so, so already. Thank you again for watching.